Hi, I'm Gib Punk, a subpar War Thunder player and a piece of bread who decided it was a good idea to try and teach people how to play this game despite not being super good at it and being bad at teaching people. But who knows? Maybe you might learn a thing or two from this video, or not, because I suck at explaining things a lot of times. But for now, let's not worry about that. Let's just get on with the video. So, buckle yourself in and get ready for a mildly acceptable guide to War Thunder. Air Edition. Before you get yourself into the heat of battle in the skies, you need to get yourself an airplane. But what kind of aircraft should you bring? Well, it all comes down to what you're looking to do. There's a few different types of aircraft you can choose from. Fighters, bombers, strike aircraft, and interceptors, along with a few others, but these are the main four we're going to be talking about. Each type of aircraft fulfills different roles, but you can use some for more than just one role. Do you want to get yourself into the rough and tumble of a dogfight with other aircraft? Then you want to get yourself a fighter. These planes are fast, agile, and have the firepower to bring down anything that's thrown at them. Are you looking to go even faster, higher, and take out enemy bombers? Then an interceptor is for you. Interceptors take a lot from their fighter counterparts, but are generally faster and have bigger guns since they were made to as their name implies, intercept enemy aircraft, particularly enemy bombers. Perhaps you want to go do some fast, low-level ground pounding. The strike aircraft are the planes for you. The strike aircraft are meant to get low and provide close air support wherever needed. They're durable and can hit both ground targets and air targets hard. Generally, strike aircraft are not really meant to get into a dogfight, but if flown correctly, they can hold their own if they need to defend themselves from enemy fighters. If you want to go do some heavy, high-altitude bombing, then bombers are the way to go. Since bombers will get a bomb site, you can use it to accurately level an area with your bombs without needing to get close to the ground and making yourself an easy target for SPAA. Do note though that bombers are usually very large and slow targets, making them easy prey for interceptors and fighters, so always be on the lookout for approaching attackers and know how to use your defensive armaments to fight them off. Once you've figured out what planes you want to use, it's time for battle. So click the to battle button and then, uh, wait, I guess? Once you get yourself into a match, go choose your preferred loadout and fuel load. The loadout you choose is up to you depending on what you plan to do. If you want to go ground pound, then you'll probably want to go bring some bombs and rockets. If you want to go fight other aircraft, then you'll want to make your plane as light as it can be, so don't bring bombs and rockets. Well, you can be rather flexible with your loadout, with your fuel load on the other hand, you can't really be as flexible. The fuel load you choose is going to be extremely important. This is where knowing your plane will come in handy. With prop aircraft, the fuel load you choose isn't super important since most of the time you can just get away with bringing a minimum fuel load most of the time. However, once you do end up getting to jets, the amount of fuel you bring is going to start getting important, and that is something I will get into later in the video. Do note that the fuel load and loadout you bring will affect the flight performance of your aircraft. A heavier load will not only make your plane slower, but will also affect its maneuverability. So it's important to find that perfect balance between actually being able to fight the aircraft you're going up against and not just running out of fuel while you're fighting. Oh, I ran out of fuel! So, after figuring that all out, now it's time for battle. So spawn in, set your flaps, or don't because it's War Thunder and half the time people don't do that on takeoff, go full throttle and start praying that you won't get shot at by a teammate on takeoff. Because remember kids, your teammates are just your enemies in blue. After getting off the ground, raise your gear and flaps and then find a good climb rate where you can keep gaining speed while still gaining altitude at a good rate. Continue climbing to your desired altitude. So while you're climbing into the sky and flying towards the battlefield, Feel free to go off and go do something else for like three hours because you gotta wait until you see your first enemy. So go watch a movie or something. Once you do eventually start seeing your first enemy aircraft, now you need to decide who you want to fight. Learning both your aircraft and the aircraft you'll be facing is key here. You generally want to stay away from aircraft that can outperform you unless you're able to catch them off guard or if you just want to take a bet that they don't know how to fly their plane, which uh happens more than you might think. Try and keep your distance from them and remain undetected by flying into the clouds or stick very low to the ground and use the terrain as cover. Use your situational awareness to scan the skies around you to make sure no one else is trying to sneak up on you. If you happen to see someone chasing down one of your teammates, they're more than likely focused on trying to shoot your teammate down rather than looking up for you. So they would be an ideal target to sneak up behind and shoot down. But a lot of times, this won't be the case. Most of the time, you will be forced into a dogfight because you and someone else just so happen to be heading straight towards each other and then they're like, oh, okay, time to fight, I guess. So in that case, don't think, just do. 
A dogfight doesn't just matter on the plane you're flying, but also the person flying it. Again, knowing your opponent and the limits of your own aircraft are vital here. Use whatever advantage you can get against your opponent. Different aircraft excel at different things. While some aircraft are great at turn fighting, others do better with boom and zoom tactics. Some aircraft will excel at higher altitudes, while others will excel at lower altitudes. Again, it really just comes down to the aircraft you're flying. If your aircraft is best at turn fighting, don't take your opponent's head on, since really there's no need to do that, and plus there's a high chance you'll end up getting yourself shot down or heavily damaged, unless you're lucky and manage to get through without getting damaged at all. So instead, bait them into a head-on, but then break off when they start shooting. Once you guys have passed each other, begin to turn back around and force them into a turn fight. If, on the other hand, your plane is meant for boom and zoom, then you want to gain as much altitude as you can and only go for targets below you, preferably the ones that you can catch off guard. Once you have identified a good target, begin your attack run on them by rolling over and diving down from above. Gain as much energy and speed as you can and then shoot at them while you're zooming past. Instead of trying to take them into a turn fight, use your energy to fly away and regain your altitude so then you can either turn around back to re-engage them or pick a new target, hence the name Boom and Zoom. Once you get yourself into a fight, you'll want to do everything you can to get into a position where you can get shots off at your target. You should look for any way to exploit your aircraft's strengths and your opponent's weaknesses. If your plane has them, you should utilize combat flaps once you start getting into those lower speed fights. Combat flaps, when used correctly, could give you that upper hand you need to win the fight. However, it's important to know when to use them. If you deploy them when you're going too fast, then you can shear off the flaps entirely. But if you're using them when you're going too slow, then your combat flaps may prove to be more detrimental than actually helpful. These factors do depend on the aircraft though, so be sure to take some time to learn your plane. You should also take some time to learn some dogfight maneuvers too, as they may prove to be extremely helpful. Many aircraft in game have something called WEP, or War Emergency Power. What is War Emergency Power? It essentially means that you're using all the power your engine has. While extremely helpful in a dogfight, WEP can very quickly overheat your engine over time. If you're not careful with your usage of WEP, you will end up damaging your engine or even flat out destroying it. You will also want to regulate your use of WEP because you don't want to overshoot your opponent. Because WEP is meant to get your plane going and up to speed, your opponent can exploit that and bleed all their energy to force an overshoot if they catch you off guard with it. This is why you need to manage your throttle carefully when in a fight with someone. Use just enough the throttle to keep yourself glued to their six, but not too little where you can't keep up with them. So, by using what you have to get yourself into a position to fire, now you need to know when to shoot your guns. In my personal experience, it'll be advantageous to you to hold your fire until your opponent is close and in a turn. Why? Because the closer they are, the easier it is to aim your guns since you generally won't have to lead your target as much. And when they're going in a turn, they will generally expose a good portion of their airframe where you can fire a burst and land lots of hits on their aircraft, hopefully taking them down if not bringing them out of the fight. It's also fine to fire at them even if there's a good space between you and them. Just make sure you give some extra lead before taking a shot. Something to note is that you should only fire in short, controlled bursts. Because you're only working with a limited amount of ammo, you want to try and make the most of it. Firing in short, controlled bursts will not only help you save your ammo, but it can still help you aim your guns if you need to. Again, just make sure you're in a good position to fire. And also look to see if they're going to cross in front of your nose. If they're crossing in front of your nose, you can take a few shots at them and potentially shoot them out of the sky. That That's another thing about dogfighting. Uh, try not to cross in front of your opponent knows. Anyways, for someone who is more on the inexperienced side, tracer rounds are vital for learning how to aim your guns while also having the added benefit of making your opponent's plane catch on fire if you hit them in the right spots. Over time, you'll probably begin to rely on tracer rounds less and less as you get used to knowing how much lead you need to give a target if you want to land some hits. Once you get the hang of this, you can end up with something like this.
Bombers may look like big and easy targets, but they can hit back harder than you may expect. Bombers are generally going to be heavily armed in the rear of the aircraft since that's where most attacks on bombers happen. Some bombers, most notably American bombers, have no blind spots for the turrets, as they will have turrets on the front, back, top, bottom, sides, you name it. But even then, most bombers are still pretty well protected from most angles of attack, so it would be best to take them on from the front since generally most bombers don't have too many turrets on the front, but if you're attacking them from the rear, just keep maneuvering to make it hard for the gunners to hit you. If you're flying the bomber that's being attacked by a fighter, it's honestly best just to take control of your gunners rather than rely on the gunner AI since at best they're kinda useless, but that's just my experience. Any aircraft is going to rely on all their engines to get around and usually can't make it far if you knock out an engine or two. So when attacking a bomber, aim for his engines. You should try to take out as many engines as you can before breaking off to go fight someone else. Again, bombers may seem like easy targets, but they'll still punch back with great force with or without engines. The longer you stick around, the longer chance you give the bombers gunners to shoot at you and possibly take you out. With that being said, while bombers rely on their engines to get home, so do the fighters. So going back to defending your bomber, if you find yourself being attacked by a fighter, just aim for the engines or take out the pilot. Bombers are mainly used in air battles to destroy enemy bases and deal massive blows to the enemy team's tickets. The amount of bombs to destroy a base will vary through the different BRs, so it's important to know how many bombs you need to use when you're bombing a base. Different sizes of bombs will do different amounts of damage. So essentially, small bomb do small damage, big bomb do lots of damage. Keep in mind that while you can just drop your entire bomb load on a single base and guarantee the base's destruction, if you know exactly how many bombs you'll need to destroy the base, you can just drop the required amount of bombs on that one base and then use the rest of your bombs to destroy something else, like either another base or even ground targets. I'll include a link to a spray sheet showing the amount of ordnance that is needed to take out a base in the description below. Bombing in smaller aircraft such as a fighter or strike aircraft can be done, but should only really be used for taking out smaller ground targets like tanks or pillboxes. Bombing without a bomb site may seem daunting at first, but with enough practice, you'll be able to accurately drop bombs with no assistance at all. To do this, you'll want to make sure you have your fuse timer set in a way that your bombs won't just immediately explode when they hit the ground. Go into a slight dive towards your target and wait until you're just a little bit out from your target, then drop your bombs. I know this is probably a terrible way of explaining this, but just practice and you'll see what I mean. The closer to the ground you get will make your bombs more likely to hit your target or at least land near them, but it also means that you put yourself at risk of crashing or getting shot down. Or if you didn't set your fuse timer correctly, Okay, so let's say you've taken some damage during a fight, but you're still flying. It's important to know what kind of damage you've taken in order to judge if you can stay in the fight or not. Generally, a few bullet holes here and there won't cause too much trouble, but if you're leaking fluids, have a destroyed engine, or survived being on fire, then you might want to consider returning back to base. Plus, a damaged aircraft won't perform as well in a fight, making you an easy target for enemy aircraft. Just remember to try and keep your speed up and stay high enough off the ground in case you need to glide the rest of the way to base. Compared to prop fighters, jets and missile combat is a whole different game. While you're still having to avoid gunfire from other jets, now you need to avoid both IR and radar missiles once you start getting into the later BRs where those missiles are prevalent. But you know, for now, we'll just stick with the early jets where gunfighting is still really the only way you're going to shoot someone down. Fighting with guns and jets remains relatively the same when coming from prop fighters. The only major difference between them is the amount of lead you need to give in a jet and the amount of rounds it actually takes to shoot someone down. Because these jets have much higher caliber of rounds compared to prop fighters, you don't need to lay in on a target just to shoot them down anymore. Maybe a few hits is enough to take out a plane by shearing its wing off or destroying the engines or something. This is good to know because jet fighters generally are going to have a lot less ammunition than you might be used to in a prop fighter, so you shouldn't be shooting in these super long bursts that you might be used to doing in some prop fighters. Oh shoot, wait, that's it for this section? Oh. Anyways. Oh jeez, this section's also really short. 
At around 9.0, you will begin running into jets with afterburning engines that can rocket them past the speed of sound. And while these planes got faster, so did their fuel consumption. Because where when your engine was just casually sipping on your fuel, now it's just chugging this fuel to use the afterburner. Meaning that your fuel usage while using the afterburner is going to be greatly increased. And if you're not careful, you'll be out of fuel quicker than you realize. So once you start using aircraft with afterburning engines, it would be wise to take some more fuel if you want to have enough fuel to get to the battle field, fight some people, and then get back home. As jet fighters got more advanced, so did the ways to shoot the other guy down. No longer did we need to get close behind someone to shoot them down with our guns. Now you can just lob a missile at them and pray it hits. Missiles in War Thunder really only become prevalent past 9.0 BR, with only a handful of planes getting missiles below 9.0, like the American F9F-8 that gets AIM-9Bs at 8.3, as of this recording. There's really only two different types of air-to-air -air missiles you'll need to know about. While technically there are more types of air-to-air -air missiles in the game, practically nobody uses them, so I have decided not to include them in this video. So the two different types of missiles I'll be talking about in this video are IR missiles and radar missiles. These types of missiles each have their own advantages and disadvantages, so it'll be very important to learn when you should or shouldn't use a certain type of missile. Infrared missiles will search for heat sources coming from an aircraft or even in some cases, the sun. If you're really unlucky, they might even begin tracking the heat signature of another jet, such as your teammate. So if you launch a missile and it starts following your teammate instead of the other guy, all you can do is just watch horror as your missile is about to make you go broke. With early missiles such as the AIM-9Bs or R-3Ss, you will need to get behind your target in order to get a lock and fire the missile. These are known as rear aspect missiles. So with these missiles, it's best to find a target that is unaware of your presence to shoot down. Once you start getting into the later BRs, these missiles will become more advanced and more maneuverable. Missiles such as the AIM-9Gs and Js, R-60s and SRAMs will begin to show up and will outperform missiles such like the AIM-9B and R-3S. Eventually, you'll start to move into the territory of the AIM-9B. AIM-9L and R-60M, which are known as all-aspect missiles. Unlike rear-aspect missiles, requiring you to get behind your target to get a lock, these all-aspect missiles can be fired from any angle, with varying results. To add to the all-aspect missiles, they also tend to be extremely maneuverable, boasting 30 to even 40 G limits. So unless you have countermeasures, dodging these missiles will prove to be extremely challenging. Radar missiles are the second type of missiles we will discuss in this video. To use radar missiles, you will need to get a radar lock on your target in order to fire your missile. Do this by pointing your aircraft in the general direction of your target and waiting for your radar to detect them. You can also use ACM mode, if your radar has it, to lock a nearby target by using your radar lock keybind with your radar off. After achieving a radar lock on your target, you can fire your missile. Be sure to watch for ground clutter, jinking maneuvers, and chaff. With most radar-guided missiles in the game being semi-active radar-guided missiles, they will require a constant lock on your target to guide themselves. However, there are some cases where these radar missiles can continue tracking the target if radar lock was lost. This, however, should not be relied upon, so it's best just to keep a lock on your target at all times. There's also active radar-guided missiles in the game, which require a lock to fire your missile at the target initially, but these missiles can continue guiding to their targets even if radar lock has been lost. Remember that when launching your missiles, no matter what missile it may be, to give some lead to it to make it easier for your missile to track its target. While it's not super important with some missiles that begin tracking straight off the pylon or have high G overloads, early radar missiles and IR missiles with low G limits will heavily benefit from you leading your target first before launching them. Now that you're at the BR where you're fighting these highly maneuverable missiles, both IR and radar guided, you're going to want something called countermeasures to help avoid getting hit. Countermeasures in War Thunder come in a few different types. First, you have flares, which are used to confuse IR missiles by shooting out of your plane and burning extremely hot to create a false heat signature, which will cause the missile to target the flare instead of your aircraft. Though just because you dump flares doesn't mean the missile won't track you. Some missiles have flare resistance and can see past those flares to keep targeting your aircraft. It's also best to fire a few bursts of flares and maneuver out of the path of the missile to avoid it. The next type of countermeasure is very similar to flares. It's called IRCM, but instead of shooting out a flare, it just straight up flashbangs the missile. It's pretty self-explanatory at that point, though some IR missiles such as the Stinger have systems which make it immune to IRCM and even flares, but because of the 10G limit of the Stinger missile, you can still just avoid it by turning away from the missile, so it's best to keep that in mind. Next up is chaff. Chaff is used to confuse the radar of an enemy aircraft and make it lose lock on you. What does that mean? If an enemy is using a semi-active radar-guided missile, 
the little strips of aluminum or plastic that shoot out of your plane will cause the enemy radar to be confused and lock your chaff rather than your actual aircraft. For early radar systems, chaff is extremely effective and should always be brought when fighting out BRs where radar missiles show up. <sighs> okay, I think that's it. Well, that's all I have for this video, guys. Uh, I really hope you guys enjoyed it. This was definitely one of my more ambitious video ideas, so I'm hoping that it at least taught you something or even just entertained you. This isn't exactly my usual type of video that I do, but I wanted to try something new because I'm just kind of just experimenting with new video ideas and stuff, so... Now I want to give a big shout out to these people on screen right now because they were instrumental in helping me gather footage for this video so then it could be possible. So without them, this video probably would have either taken a lot longer to get out or just wouldn't happen at all. So thank you so much to these people for taking the time out of their day to help me make this video. I also just want to thank you guys for sticking around this long and watching this entire video. Your support means everything to me. And yeah, I really hope you guys just enjoyed this video. Anyways, make sure you guys leave a like on this video, and if you enjoy the content, be sure to go check out some of my other stuff, and subscribe if you like the channel. And I will see you guys in the next video.